Welcome to the Unconventional Path, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Stories and Ideas. Hi, I'm Bala Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Today, we are excited to be joined by James Sinal. James runs the Rochester Angel Network. You know, Rochester is a medium-sized city in upstate New York, very close to Toronto, Canada. Now, Bela, tell me a bit about Rochester. It's not too far from where you grew up, isn't it? Because that's an interesting part of his story, I think, that the audience might not know about. Yeah, it sure is a very interesting part of the story. You know, Rochester was once a remarkable, thriving industrial hub. It's headquarters for Kodak, Xerox, and Bosch and & Loam. Those were three really large companies in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, you know, in one generation, uh, all of them collapsed. Kodak's film photography business went away. Uh, it went from being number one and huge as digital photography came out. Uh, the, the photographic film business just went away and Kodak did not adapt. Interestingly enough, actually the digital imaging systems or camera was actually invented by Kodak. It's a great study. There's been a lot of papers written on it. Uh, and for, for people who might be interested in it, it's something you should check out. It's, it's a great study on how large companies oftentimes ignore competing technologies and it ends to their eventual demise. Also, Xerox, their photocopier business was huge and that got disrupt, disrupted by new technologies and competitors. And Bosch and Loam that made eyeglasses and contact lenses and like a lot of U.S. companies, moved their manufacturing overseas and to lower cost regions. So these three large companies all sort of are skeletons of what their former selves uh, were. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of great universities there. There's Rochester Institute of Technology. There's uh, the University of Rochester. Uh, and they have spurred a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship. And James Sinal, our guest, is one of those people. Uh, he runs the business incubator in Rochester. He's been doing that for many years. And he is leading the Rochester Angel Network, and he's been doing that for the past 15 years since its inception. So, Bela, maybe explain a little bit what angel investors do and how angel investing fits into kind of the hierarchy of private equity. Sure. So private equity is sort of the large umbrella that is uh, uh, the umbrella for all sorts of ways of raising capital, fundamentally through private sources and not in the public markets. Uh, and angel investing is a small segment of this. And an angel investor is typically a high net worth individual who's investing their own money in a startup company. And they do that in exchange frequently for an equity share of the business. Uh, sometimes they do it uh, for um, a, a debt, but most of the times it's for an equity piece of the business. And, you know, there are, uh, there's in the United States, at least, there's this uh, category of something called an accredited an investor. Uh, and that's uh, some laws or regulations that were put in place by the Securities and Exchange Commission to sort of protect investors. And an, an accredited investor is a person who has at least a million dollars of net worth. So that when they're investing money, uh, you know, there were examples in the past of people being swindled out of their money and they put all their life savings into something and, you know, they lose it all because these investments, angel investing is a high risk endeavor. Um, so it should be an accredited investor. Uh, and angel investors many times are former entrepreneurs themselves. So they've been successful entrepreneurs. They've made a fair amount of money and it's kind of sort of their way of giving back to the community um, and to giving back to the entrepreneurial process and to help and catalyze economic growth. You know, angels make their return uh, just like a venture capital does or anyone in, in private equity. It, it's, you know, they, they own a piece of the company. They own a percentage of the business typically. Uh, and then when there's an exit, meaning either that company is sold uh, and, and bought by a larger company uh, or the company goes public, and then those shares of stock that they own, the ownership in that company they have, becomes liquid. It's something that they can actually sell and buy. Uh, and, you know, angel investing is pretty big. 
Um, there's a Center for Venture Research uh, that estimates that the U.S. angel investors invested tw- almost $25 billion in about 71,000 small businesses in 2015. I know that data is a little aged, but it's the latest, latest data that I was able to find. Uh, so, you know, that's a lot of money in a lot of businesses spread across businesses. Most of the times, angel investors uh, invest uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars. So these are, you know, uh, spread across a bunch of different businesses. And it's, it's oftentimes the very first piece of capital, outside capital, that a company raises comes from angel investors. Uh, you know, and angel investors tend to invest in companies that are located close to where they're located. So within their region, um, and and that's just because again they're trying to give back to their community. Typically, they're trying to give back to the entrepreneurial efforts that are going on in their community, and and they're trying to be supportive of their community. And that's what they know. They know the people there. That's where their networks are. They know businesses there. So that's typically uh, how they invest. Uh, angel investors come in many different forms. Uh, some are very loosely organized, uh, as you will hear about the Rochester Angel Network. Uh, Jim's going to talk about uh, sort of this transition that the Rochester Angel Network went through, uh, where they were very loosely organized in the beginning. Uh, and then as time evolved, uh, the Rochester Angel Network uh, is more like a VC model, where they actually raise a pot of money, and then they invest that money. Uh, but Angel networks come in all different flavors. So one are very loosely organized where each individual member of the angel network makes a decision whether they invest in a particular company or not, or they all contribute to a pot of money. And then there's some investment committee that makes the decision whether they invest a percentage of that pot of money in the company or not. There are also independent angel investors, uh, just an individual person, uh, you know, who might meet an entrepreneur at an event They get intrigued by what they're doing, and as an individual, uh, they'll invest. So angel investing covers this broad spectrum of uh, people uh, and ways of investing, and there's no one model that is universal or perfect. Uh, And it's, you know, it's a really very important aspect of raising capital. Uh, It's sort of the entry-level mechanism that entrepreneurs use to access money from the investing community. And, you know, what James is doing in Rochester is really an interesting story, and it's really an important element of private equity investing. Great, Bella. That was a great overview of what angel investors do, the different formats and types of angel investors that are out there and the networks that have evolved and how it fits into private equity in general. So I think at this point, let's get on to the interview with James. Today's guest is James Sinal. James runs the Rochester Angel Network in Rochester, New York. The Rochester Angel Network has been around for 15 plus years and is one of the older angel networks in the United States. James has a lot of experience in running it and has learned many lessons over these years. So welcome to the show, James. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me, Bale. It's great to be here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the Rochester Angel Network. Sure. The Rochester Angel Network is a group of um, mostly local high net worth individuals that are interested in investing in early stage high growth opportunities. Uh, We were founded back in 2005. Uh, We operated as a network model for a while, and I can talk about what that means. And then eventually we raised a first fund and raised a second fund. And we've probably done about 30, 35 deals in total um, since the foundation. Yeah, nice. So yeah, talk about sort of the evolution on on how sort of the the Rochester Angel Network has evolved over the years. Well, early on, I mentioned we were a network model, which was pretty common at the time. And essentially what that meant was we had a group of individuals. We probably had 35 members or so. And um, we would get together once a month in person, usually a breakfast meeting or a late afternoon meeting. And we would invite some entrepreneurs to come and present. We had a screening committee that would sort of select which entrepreneurs got in. They'd come and pitch, pretty traditional format, 15 or so minute pitch, 15, 20 minutes of Q&A. 
And then after that, entrepreneur would leave and people in the network would kind of raise their hands and say, I'm interested in pursuing this further or not. And we collect seven or eight people that were interested and kind of off they went uh, to the side and they looked at the deal and they might invest or not. So that worked for a while, um, but it didn't work great, <laughs> to be quite honest, because, um, you know, you had very few people sort of um, doing deals, quite frankly. Um, so we evolved to a fund model whereby everyone put a little bit of money into a fund. It was a small amount just to try to get them some skin in the game. It was 25K minimum. Um, some did more, but that was the minimum. And we ended up getting 67 investors to put into a fund and we raised a $2 million fund. And so the fund model then became entrepreneur comes in. It was still a democratic process. All members voted whether the fund should proceed or not. If it did, we sort of had a standing due diligence committee that would take the lead and try to push the deal and move the deal forward. Ultimately writing up a recommendation that went back to everyone and then everyone voted again to accept it or not. Um, and so it allowed us to put a, a more formalized process around everything. It allowed us to kind of market a little bit better to entrepreneurs and say, we actually have a fund, it can invest. It's not, hey, come pitch, you might get one guy doing a 25K check. Um, and so we invested out of fund one, we did 14 deals, have had three exits. Um, COVID wasn't particularly helpful for some of those companies, but fingers are still crossed. And then uh, fund two, we launched three years ago. We already have, I think, 13 or so investments out of that one. Yeah. Wow. So that's a nice evolution. And, and you're finding this sort of fund structure to be more efficient. It's sort of more focused and, and works well, both for the investors and for the entrepreneurs, it sounds like. Yeah, it's, it's a much better model. Uh, it's, it's more professional model, if I can say that. Um, and I, what I forgot to point out is that once the fund decides to invest, all of those 60 members can also invest additional personal funds alongside kind of a sidecar kind of a model. So they still have the ability to invest more if they want, and they're still getting kind of a due diligence report from the team that's sort of putting that together. Yeah. So when you guys are looking at a company, uh, let's first focus on the entrepreneur, the founder. What do you look for uh, in a founder or an entrepreneur? For founders, we look for the typical sorts of things. Um, do they have any industry experience? Do they have any expertise in this sector that they're going after? Um, do they have any startup experience? Um, if not, can we see that they've actually uh, made a lot of progress? So it's it's not a deal killer for us if someone's a first time entrepreneur, um, but we wanna see some evidence that they have actually moved the ball forward. They're actually executing. And ideally they've got advisors or a board of directors that does have that startup experience. Somebody in the, the broader realm has to have been through the process before. I see. Um, so those are kind of the, the couple of things we look for. Yeah, and what about, is there particular uh, sectors or industries that you invest in or focus on? We're not um, focused on any particular industry. We're sort of more focused geographically. So we'll look at deals in a broader, um, we'll call upstate New York. So around a, maybe a three hour radius from where we're located. And that, that sort of is the mission of how our group was founded. It was local high net worth people that were interested in investing in more local sorts of companies. Um, we used to say, Every one of our members had three goals. It was uh, do good, have fun, and make money. It was just the order of those things that changed depending on the person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. The the priorities shift sometimes. Uh, so, what's the typical size of a company? Are they pre revenue? Do they have some revenue? That's evolved over time as well. Um, I'd say in the early years of Rochester Angel Network, we often were looking at pre revenue companies. Um, that has shifted a little bit later, um, more recent years or more five or seven years to be post revenue is ideal, uh, or some demonstration that the market is actually, um, buying into your value prop. Um, and so we'd love to see if there's some initial customers or at least paid pilots, something where someone's handing over some money to demonstrate, um, they believe in what you're doing. Um, we haven't done a deal in a while that was kind of before that, um, where it's trust us, <laughs> you know, this is the best thing since sliced bread. We want to see some kind of validation. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. And, uh, what, uh, 
what sort of leadership team do you look for? Do you, do you look for, you know, a built out leadership team or what's sort of the status of a leadership team when you typically invest? It's almost always partial uh, at the point we're looking at them. Um, you know, hopefully finding a, a CEO, like I said, that's demonstrating that they can actually execute. Um, they usually don't have a strong sales um, function at the time we're looking at them because they're just getting those first couple of orders or their first pilots or their first letters of intent. Um, so that's usually an area that we're we're hoping they have a plan to fill. But um, at least a two or three person kind of core team is is sort of what we're seeing. And and uh, once they take this investment in from you, what's the typical size of a of your a round that you guys do? It can vary from um, anywhere from 50k to 300k, somewhere in that range. Um, another evolution of the group is we've started over the last toward the end of Fund One and and certainly all of Fund Two, kind of doing somewhat small first investments, um, maybe 50, 100K, and then reserving at least one or one and a half times that to follow on the ones that are doing well. So um, we can do a maximum of about 200K out of the fund in any one deal. Um, and so sometimes we're splitting that between a 50 and a 150 if they're doing well. Yeah. So uh, what does doing well mean to you guys as, as an <laughs> angel investor, right? What does doing well mean? That's a great question. Um, so doing well, if we we're going to do a follow on, uh, you know, 12 months later from the initial investment or so, um, we definitely want to see sort of that that revenue ramping up the dog eating the dog food, as uh, some like to say, um, again, more proof that the product market fit is real, that the value proposition is being believed and uh, people are willing to actually pay money for this thing. Yeah. So you want to see some traction, as they call it, right? Maybe exactly. some sales, some additional customers, maybe introduction of a new product uh, or two. Yes, absolutely. Very good. Uh, and what sort of a role does Rochester Angel Network take post-investment in the company? It's a fairly, um, it's been a fairly hands-off role. Um, our goal was to try to leverage the 60 members we have to be helpful to anybody in the portfolio. And uh, as you can imagine, with that size group of fairly successful people and their networks, um, we can be helpful opening doors to potential customers or helping find advisors or, or whoever or whatever. Um, I'd say in reality, um, we haven't really achieved that goal um, because everyone is kind of busy with their day things, whether their jobs or retirement or, or whatever else. Um, so we still make that as an offer to the portfolio companies, you know, keep us in, involved, make sure you're giving us updates at least quarterly would be great. Um, and let us know what issues you're having or problems or opportunities, and we'll be happy to search the network and find some solutions. So, yeah. um, the offer stands with, with all the companies, uh, but I'd say, um, we haven't done as good a job as we probably could in, in exercising that, that resource. And do you get, so it sounds like you, you don't take a board seat, you don't have a board observer role or anything like that? No, we definitely aren't taking board seats. Um, we're typically a small part of the rounds um, and uh, observer spots would be great. But we're, again, we're typically not in a position to require those things of the companies. Okay, so one thing we didn't talk about is, uh, so you guys are often investing alongside others, it sounds like. We are, yes. Very rarely would be the only investor in a round. Okay, and that uh, uh, those other investors are uh, private equity funds, a venture fund, or is it some other other entities? The other investors are typically they could be other angels as individuals, they could be other angel groups or funds as as entities. Um, they could be early stage venture capital funds uh, that are often again times regionally focused, or they could be alongside. Um, there are many accelerator programs now um, that will invest kind of at the end of the accelerator program, maybe do 100K, 200K, and we might be co-investing sort of at that stage. Yes. Okay. So rarely do you guys invest solo, it sounds like. Correct. And uh, what's the typical form of the investment? Is it equity? Is it a convertible note? Uh, it's both. We'll do both. Um, at the early stages, we're often seeing notes or, or more Frequently now seeing safes, um, similar but different. Um, and then in the follow on rounds, you know, usually those are priced equity rounds, um, typically preferred stock. We don't want to do common stock. 
Um, we'd like to do preferred stocks. So it's, it's typically convertible notes and then a priced equity round in preferred. Yeah. And so if you guys invest alongside others, probably the first uh, institutional money, uh, you know, non-friends and family money that goes into a business um, in the follow on rounds, which they're almost hopefully, hopefully there are follow on rounds if things are going well. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys try to participate in those as well? We do now. Yes. So, so that evolution from the old model or we might do a 200 K in the first tranche and then hope it goes up. Now we're kind of reserving and then we can then follow on in the, in the next round and um, sort of double down or triple down on the ones that are doing well. Yeah. Yeah. So your model in many ways is very similar to seed stage uh, venture funds, right? I mean, yeah, it, it, it has evolved to that. Yes. Yeah. You, you guys behave and look very much like a seed stage investor fund. Yeah. Yeah. So do you guys have a, a limited partner agreement with uh, the members of the group, just like a regular uh, uh, venture fund would? We do. It's uh, it's structured as an LLC fund. Um, but yes, we have 67 members in the fund, all of whom I have to send K-1s to next week. Yes. <laughs> so yes, we have a lot of members. And we have a general partner. Um, the due diligence committee is part of the general partnership, so they do get a small carried interest as part of that. Okay, cool. So uh, you've been doing this. Uh, how long has the Rochester Angel Network been around? Uh, we founded it in 2005. Okay, so it's it's been around for a while. And sort of what are the lessons that you guys have learned in, in those uh, what, uh, 15 years, I guess? Wow, there's probably a lot of them. <laughs> um, I'd say um, one as far as uh, we already talked about structure of the entity, um, the fund model versus the network model, I think personally is, is a better model, uh, produces more engagement. People have skin in the game. They show up to meetings. Um, they're more interested in participating. So from a how you operate model, yeah. um, what else have we learned? I mean, always learning as far as when you're looking at deals, um, my people that have done this their whole lives as their actual career, not just volunteering and doing this stuff, still are trying to get better at how do you find yeah. deals that are the winners sure, and, and not. And uh, it's just a hard thing to do. So um, I think, again, the model of the uh, like a seed venture fund of invest a little bit in many and then invest more in the ones that are getting traction, I think, is working out. At least we're seeing that's working out a little better. Yeah. And so when someone comes in to pitch you, uh, you know, come in and pitch the fund, uh, an entrepreneur, wh what are the red flags? Are there, are there certain things that, you know, if the person does or says or behaves in a certain way are like, whoop, nope, this is a red flag. Yeah, there are quite a few. Um, and as I get older, as soon as I hear these things coming out their mouth, I get like, <laughs> oh God, please don't say this, right? Um, there's the typical things, which, I mean, you know full well, but uh, how big is the market, right? And, you know, when they talk about it's a trillion dollar market and I get X percent, I'm a billion dollar company. And you're like, Ugh, you know, you don't want to hear that, right? You got to build it up, bottoms up, all that kind of stuff. Or competition, right? There's nothing out there. There's nobody else out there. And we sort of say status quo is a pretty good competitor, right? They don't have to change their <laughs> what they're doing today to incorporate your thing. Or one other one that's um, often a red flag um, or stops entrepreneurs dead in their tracks is a lot of times they'll want to really emphasize their own experience or their board members or advisors that are super successful. And they'll say, "I'm this is my fifth startup and I've had three successful exits. And I've got this board member who's a multimillionaire who says this is the best thing they've ever seen. And you just wait for the question that says, that's great. How much are you or that board member putting into this round? And when they say, oh, well, they're not investing right now, it's like, oh, you just lost all credibility. Yeah. So those are a couple of probably dozens and dozens of red flags. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good list. That's a, that's a, that's a very good list. And uh, so as, as you guys uh, think about the future for Rochester Angel Network, what do you see that's on the horizon for you guys? Well, I see a lot of opportunity. So the deal flow in our part of the world um, has just gotten way, way better over the last five years. Um, there have been three unicorns in the last two years. There's So there's a lot going on. There's actually more venture funds being created and raised as we speak. 
to serve sort of this New York State, upper New York State area and, and going a little further west. Um, so I see opportunity. Um, I think for the angel group, angel fund, I think we could continue on what we're doing. We could do fund three and we could do fund four. And it's a, it's a way for folks to stay in the game and participate and maybe coach and mentor some earlier stage entrepreneurs and, and have something like that to do. Yeah. Um, or we might decide we want to evolve the model yet again into something else, which I don't know what that is yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Hey, so Jim, thank you very much for taking the time to, to speak with me here today. Is there anything uh, that I didn't ask you uh, that I should have about sort of uh, Rochester Angel Network and sort of angel investing? No, I think you're an expert in this field, Bela, so I think you uh, cover all the bases. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for, thanks for taking the time to uh, uh, participate in this interview, Jim. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. Bela, that was a really interesting interview, and I really learned a lot about how angel investors have transitioned into these, mod these networks models uh, that move a little closer to the venture capital model um, and not the original independent investment decisions where a individual just kind of gives money on her, his own, their own uh, interest. Um, what did you think? Yeah, I agree with you, Mike. It's interesting how uh, over the years, last 20 or 30 years, angel networks have gotten more organized. Uh, I think they have found that when they collectively get together, uh, they have better results. Uh, they can invest larger sums of money, uh, which oftentimes helps the company. And there's something to think about that's really important here that I, that I want to talk about. And it spans angel investing and it spans venture investing. You know, when you make an investment in a company and let's say you value that company at uh, uh, just for discussion purposes, $5 million when you make your investment. And if things go well, it's great. Because the next time the company needs money, hopefully they're valued at some number larger than $5 million. And, and that's good for you as an earlier investor. But sometimes things don't go as well as you would like. And then the company needs capital again because they've run out of capital. And they need to raise money and the company's only valued at $3 million. Well, this means that the stock that you bought is now worth less than what you paid for it when you bought that stock, you know, a year or two or three years ago when you made your initial investment in the company. And oftentimes the new investor coming in will put a condition on them investing in the company. And that condition will be, they want all of the previous investors to also participate in this new round of investing. And if they don't participate, their preferred shares of stock are going to be converted to common shares of stock. This happens more frequently than you people like to admit. So that means if you're an early investor, you need to have reserve capital. Because if you can only allocate X number of dollars per investment or per company, and you allocated all of that money in your initial investment, now you don't have money to put in for a follow-on investment. And it's really important to have those reserves of capital. And angel networks have found that by being organized and by having sort of more discipline in their investing processes and by having a pot of money, they can protect themselves when things don't go as well as they should. Or if things go really well, they can double up. They can put more money into the company, right? So there's, it's always good to have this reserve capital. And when the angel investors are sort of loosely organized and they're making individual investment decisions, oftentimes, you know, they weren't prepared for either things going really well or for things not going well. And it's also detrimental to the company when that happens. Um, so uh, I think that's been one of the forcing functions, if you will, that have gotten these sort of angel networks to be a, a little more organized. Uh, they have more capital. Uh, and it, it just has been good for both entrepreneurs and investors. Neat. One of the things that I noticed, my first interactions with angels was mm, when it had been about 1998, I think, 97, 98, so late 90s in Washington, D.C. Um, and they'd have a breakfast, the major, the major angel network had a breakfast. Um, I think it was once a month and it, it expanded to twice a month. And um, yeah. you would send in a short 
summary of your business plan and either you got invited to present at breakfast or not. And yes. you were limited to, I think it was, I don't know, 10 minutes or something like that, yep. a very short pitch. Um, and then everybody would go and there'd be a little mixing and mingling after that you'd have breakfast. Then after the breakfast, there'd be some mixing and mingling and you would get asked follow-up questions. And then they would kind of sit together and in a couple the next day or a couple of days later, you'd get word um, if somebody wanted to make an investment or not and then you'd go through yeah, the paperwork. Exactly. Very typical model. Yep. And then now um, we they use technology a lot more, I've noticed. The people that I know that do this and a lot of the documentation goes in online and a lot of times they don't even the, – the pitch can be these crafted videos. It's not even necessarily live and they make decisions almost asynchronously. Then maybe have a Zoom conference to ask some questions. And one of the, 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 the kind of cool aspects of that is, is um, it's taken away a little bit of the regionality. That regional knowledge you talked about is really important to know the market, but it also limits people having access to, to capital and investors to limiting access to ideas um, when we have these geographic boundaries. So one thing that technology has been cool for is it's opened up investing so that it can go beyond these regional geographic boundaries and more people can have more access to capital. And obviously investors have ideas, uh, access to a wider range of ideas. The, the side benefit of this has been that there's been some really good data that shows that women and, and people of color have had less access than white men, essentially, in the yes. United States to, um, to, to angel investing capital and to venture capital, capital as well. Um, the goal obviously is to get the best ideas and the best, um, uh, entrepreneurs out in front and to, to get access to, to investment. Um, and if we're limiting who gets access, we limit access to the best ideas. So it's neat. Now there's angel investing groups that are specifically tailored for, let's say women or people of color and groups that have been underserved by the private equity community for as long as it's existed. I mean, let's face it. It was started by rich white men pretty much. And it became that environment, right? That's who had access. Um, and it was through university connections and through, uh, the business community. So it was pretty hard for people that weren't rich white men to kind of break into that, to that group. A lot of groups, the group in DC that I, that I went in front of, they did a great job of leveraging the academic connections, right? That universities had more open doors and then they used those connections to get people engaged and involved in the community. And that was awesome. But technology now helps, um, helps break those barriers down as well. And we're starting to see some progress, which is really cool in lots of areas of the United States anyways, um, of more people having wider access to capital. And at the same time, investors are having access to a wider range of ideas and, right. and, and, and viewpoints. What's your take on this? Yeah. You know, angel investing has really led in this arena. Uh, they have led the private equity industry in sort of looking at these considerations and looking at underserved markets. They, they were sort of the, the, the leaders in that regard. And, you know, you can take a look at private equity, venture capital, angel investors, and, and you can target your investments in many different directions. Some people target it only in financial technologies. Some people target it only in a geographic space. Some people target it only towards under specific underserved markets, right? So there's many dimensions in which you can decide to target what you're doing. And, and so there is no right or wrong way. They're, they're all good. They're all good segments. And, and you just decide from your investment thesis how you want to target them. And people have sort of multiple targets oftentimes. You know, they will say, we're going to invest in, in new media in underserved geographic markets because that's what they're trying to accomplish. So they have this double mission. And, and that has sort of worked its way into venture capital clearly, uh, again, it had its beginnings in, I think, in angel investing because, again, it's individuals doing a lot of this stuff, and they and people often in high net worth individuals often invest for a multitude of reasons, not just a financial return. It's not their primary thing they're trying to accomplish. Um, and corporate venture groups have done this as well, where companies have said we're we're trying to you know build economic vitality in a particular part of the region sometimes for self-serving reasons because that's where they are and they want it to be economically vibrant. Uh, so they're, they're spreading their money around in that region, but that's good. And, and so I think that's great, a great topic. And it's, it's something that again, was started by sort of the angel investors 
in the in the investing community and and now has propagated itself into all aspects of private equity. Great. Bela, what do you think? Time to wrap it up? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, great. I mean, so the takeaways today from this interview, I think were fourfold. Um, so first, it was a great primer to angel investing. Um, second, it was really interesting to kind of see um, how individual vent, uh, angel investors band together to create these networks and how over time these networks have become more structured and more organized. That leads to kind of the third takeaway, which is entrepreneurs and, and wannabe entrepreneurs need to really do their homework. They need to find their local networks. They need to find networks that might be out there that might be more geographically independent that they might access. Find out what their specialty areas, like you said, are and what their focus focus areas are. Um, and that leads to the fourth takeaway, which is to kind of make sure you understand what the goals of the angel community that you're addressing are and make sure that your your goals are aligned with their goals. A, so that it's a good, more likely to have a good fit, but B, so that you, you both wind up kind of in a win-win situation. There's lots of um, opportunities. We're going to talk about this, I think, in some of the later interviews. But it was a misfit, right? So you really want to, one of the key themes um, is really understand the goals of the people who are doing the investing if you're the one that's looking for investment so that you can make sure that it's a good match and it's a good fit. I agreed, Great. Mike. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for interviewing James, Bela. That was really interesting. Yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. Listeners, thanks for joining us today. We hope you found this episode interesting and thought-provoking. If you have questions about what we've discussed, please get in touch with us. Our email is bela.and.mike at gmail.com. Hey, and please do follow the podcast if you haven't already. So until next time, signing off from upstate New York. See you soon, Mike. Sounds great, Bela, from over here in Münster, Germany. See you next time. <laughs>